Hello, this is Stacy Steinbach and Erin Weathers. We work for the LGBT Center at the University of Louisville, and we are so excited to be talking with you in Owensboro on our BSN Extension campus. Thank you so much for your interest in LGBT healthcare. Today, we're really gonna be reviewing the basics. We encourage you to look for other opportunities to continue learning about this important topic. There is quite a bit of depth in this topic, and I feel sure that at the end of this presentation, you'll be excited to learn more. <laughs> A little bit about us here at the University of Louisville. You can feel proud to be part of a university that has um, a long history of success in working with LGBT populations. Um, the LGBT Center is 10 years old here at the University of Louisville. We were the first LGBT Center to open at a university in the state of Kentucky. And because of our diligent work over the last 10 years, and also because of the courageous leadership of leaders here at the university, we've been able to be awarded five out of five stars for LGBTQ inclusion for three years in a row. And you can look that up on the Pride Index and learn more about other universities around the country. So what are we gonna do today? We have some great topics for you. We're gonna be looking at some very specific concepts and making sure that everyone feels comfortable being able to differentiate between them and define them. We'll review some key terms that are important to this population so that you feel comfortable using those. We're gonna take a deep dive into intersectionality and explain why it's important to understanding uh, these particular populations, and then identify social determinants of health and disparities for this population. We'll identify strategies for decreasing barriers to care so that you feel like at the end of this presentation today, you have some very specific things that you can go out and do for your patients tomorrow. And then finally, we're gonna make sure that you have um, an increased awareness of the resources that you can be providing this community. Uh, those resources are really important, they're very specific, and uh, people will really appreciate that you have them on hand. I'm passing the mic off now to my colleague, Aaron Weathers. Da, 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 da. Yes, so the first thing to think about when we talk about gender and sexuality is, um, is the, uh, there's four different concepts. So we use this example, the gender-bred person, uh, to, to demonstrate this. So gender and sex, or biological sex, tend to get conflated and used interchangeably. However, what we have come to understand is gender is actually divided into two different areas. First being gender identity. And this is pretty much how you and your head think about yourself. It's the chemistry that composes you. So this is not only our hormonal levels, but it's also how we interpret what that means. And you can see this best dis demonstrated on the gender-bred person using the brain. But then there's this idea of gender expression. And gender expression is really how we demonstrate our gender. So this is based really off of social and traditional gender norms. And it's through the ways that we act, the ways we dress, also the ways we behave and interact. And this is how we um, comply, com this is how it is demonstrated through our entire body. Now as you can see, between gender identity and expression, you can see them moving on a continuum between woman, man, or something neither or neither or both being gender queer, um, or feminine, masculine, or neither or both being androgynous. But the thing that we usually focus on, especially within the medical field, is biological sex or sex assigned at birth. Now this biological sex refers to the objectively measurable organs, hormones, or, chrom or chromosomes that one has at birth. Um, has at birth. This can either be female XX or male XY, or we have also known to understand that there could be both or intersex. Lastly, something that also gets conflated with our gender identity or gender expression is our sexual orientation. Now this comes down to really who am I physically, spiritually, and or emotionally attracted to. And this is based off of the ideas of heterosexuality, which is um, different sex relationships or different gender relationships. Um, then we also have on this on this on this demonstration it says homosexual. However, you'll come to know that we don't actually use homosexual or homosexuals anymore. It was it was uh, banned out of the DSM-4 in 1973 as a mental illness. So we would say LG, LG, lesbian or gay. But then you also have in the middle bisexual, and we've also understood terms such as pansexual that we'll discuss a little bit later. Now, in specific you can see these four areas broken up into sexual orientation, lesbian, gay, bisexual, queer, 
straight, and pansexual. Uh, just to explain a little bit of what queer is, it can be a political as well as a social identity. Myself, personally, I find that to define my identity better than necessarily gay or any of the other terms because it's more so an undefined term. Um, also pansexual, which is means that I love the person, not the gender or the uh, genitalia, so you hear some people say. So that means that they would be men, women, uh, uh, cisgender, as well as transgender folks. It's really about that person, that personal connection. Moving over to gender identity, you will see the a cisgender, which is you, you identify with your sex assigned at birth, transgender, as well as gender queer. If we go down to the right quadrant, right, lo right lower quadrant, you will see gender expression, which can be gender non-conforming. You don't conform to the social gender norms or gender conforming. You do conform with them. Um, and then if we move over, this is the ideas of sex development, which is coming from biological sex. We see male, female. There's also DSD, which differences of sex development, as well as intersex. So really what I want to understand, uh, that I understand as a black queer man is that this, this information is very, very important to know. So as a member of the LGBTQ community, I say it's really important to ask. So when in doubt, ask. I understand that sometimes it can be a little uncomfortable to ask people about these very private matters, but really you need to understand as a medical professional. Terms change constantly and they carry different meanings for different people. So really don't be afraid to ask your patients about their identity. We have uh, done bleh, multiple surveys and did countless um, research on finding that people do want us to ask. So you can use an example such as, thank you for sharing with me that you identify as gender nonconforming. Please tell me more about what that means so, to you so that I can provide you with the best care possible. It is really of the utmost importance and it just really increases that meaningful relationship between you and your patient. So here next, we're going to talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about some terms that we should use as well as terms that we should not use. Um, first being transgender versus transgendered. I want to bring a particular focus to the idea of the ED on the, uh, the second term. Really what um, trans folks have talked about is this is always a finite process. It's not something that's over and done, but it's something that they are continuously con uh, tongue tied today, continuously tra uh, trans uh, transitioning through life. Also, the next terms will be trans man, F to M, female to male, or trans woman, M to F, male to female. And we use these over the ideas of transsexual. Now, if a patient happens to identify themselves as transsexual, you would want to mirror the language back to them. However, if they do not identify as transsexual, you would usually prefer trans man or trans woman. Next, the, uh, the differences of sex development affected or DSD affected or intersex over the outdated antiquated term hermaphrodite. Um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about some phrases that are really helpful within engaging with your patients. First being, what name would you like me to use for your legal or insurance purposes? This is greatly preferred over, what's your real name? That's a little bit intrusive and the idea is, regardless of the legal or insurance purposes, what they tell you their name is, is their real name. Another one that is a little bit uncouth, as my aunt would say, is pre-op, are you pre-op or post-op? Now the op is referring to the idea of gender reassignment surgery. Um, if it's not necessary for that um, engagement, you might not want to say this, as well as it's really focusing on the genitalia of the individual. And then last a phrase is, what pronoun would you like me to use? This is referring to PGP's preferred gender pronoun. And we say this preferably over he, she, or it. And lastly, you will see gay, lesbian, LGBT, LG, or LGBTQ, or sexual orientation. These are preferred over homosexual, which was seen as a mental pathology until 1973, a sexual preference, or even lifestyle choice. And then last at the bottom, we will see, I'll point to the idea of gender neutral terms. Now, gender neutral terms use the singular they, their, or them. Also, another gender neutral term that can be used with heterosexual folks as well as LGBTQ members is partner. And that is just who is your significant other. 
And also, this is so difficult for me being a Southern boy, but the idea is to drop sir or ma'am because these are also inherently gender terms and we don't want to offend any of our patients. So I know that this is a lot, but once, uh, just to kind of explain just sexual orientation and just a little bit more specifics, um, sexual orientation can be conceived of in three different areas and they can overlap or not at all. First being identity. This is referring to how one identifies, if they actually identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, or anything else between. The second thing, that component of sexual orientation is attraction or desire. This is when I have that fire burning in my soul for that other person. And the lastly is behavior. This is when one is engaging in same-sex behavior. Uh, usually having sexual intercourse with someone of the same sex or gender. Now, the LGBTQ community, we are a very diverse population. Uh, when we think about the United States as a whole, um, there is about 0.3% of transgender identity identified folks. Now, as you can see, this is there's very limited studies. We encourage people to research about trans folks because we actually think that this might number be a lot higher. Secondly, when we think about people with gay, lesbian, or bisexual identities, it's estimated that there's about 2.2 to 4% of the population that identify as LGB. Now, this implies that there's probably about 5.2 million to 9.5 million individuals that are 18 or over that are identified as LGB. Now, as far as people behaving or engaging in same-sex behaviors or same-sex sexual contacts, it is reported at about 9%. And lastly, the attraction. At least 11% of people reported that they have some same-sex attraction. And also, a lot of people you'll hear, they've never met a gay person in their life. They don't know anybody. But what we find is there's at least one same-sex household in 99% of all the United States counties. So just thinking about that incredible diversity, we as the LGBTQ community are a part of every geographic region, culture, age category, race, political affiliation, socioeconomic class, citizenship status, and so forth and so forth and so forth. But what do we have in common? What makes us a community? Well, it's the common experience of stigma and discrimination related to us being either a sexual and or a gender minority. So a clinical tip that we know that's really important is never to make assumptions about who is or who isn't LGBT. I understand that sometimes you might not, my gender expression as well as my gender identity might not conform to societal standards, but you should not ever make any assumptions about that. So, I, so a, a good example would be, I ask all of my patients these questions because I serve a diverse patient population. Do you identify as heterosexual, gay, lesbian, or bisexual, or use a different term? Have you ever identified as transgender? This one makes me feel validated as a member of the LGBTQ community because I understand that you are being an ally and standing up for the, or my people in the community, as well as something that might help the comfort level because some folks are uncomfortable asking. It's really just normalizing this question because remembering that everybody has a sexual orientation as well as a gender identity. Now, in 1989, Kimberly Williams Crenshaw defined the term intersectionality. And really what intersectionality does is it describes the various sociocultural categories and other axes of identity that interact on multiple and often simultaneous levels, contributing to systematic social inequality. Now, I know that that was a really, really big term, so let me just break it down a little bit for you. My name is Aaron, and I am Southern, but I'm also black, I'm also queer, I'm also male, um, I am middle, I'm lower to middle class, um, but I do have a master's degree. I am completely able, but I have really bad asthma, so I can't run too much. Um, I'm 27 years old. These are all things that holistically make up me as an individual. Now, I can never separate out any of these identities. I'm always going to experience them not as an addition, but as a, multipli as a multiplicative. So if I experience homophobia, I experience racialized homophobia because I experience it as a black queer man. I never experience it as just a, as a white queer man might. 
um, or if I experience some type of um, classism, it's going to ex experience different belief because of me being black and queer. So these are all going to interweave and make a very unique experience for the folks that you're going to be engaging with. So always understanding that there's a lot of different social discourses at play when our patients come in to see us. So now we're going to show a little video that we have created just to really hammer home this idea of intersectionality. My name is Victoria Taylor. I identify as trans. Um, there's no other identities that I identify with other than trans women of color. My name is Lee Micah Fox, and I am a queer, disabled, uh, gender queer. Uh, my name is Rita Mae Dunn, and I am uh, identify as female. Uh, I also identify as um, <clears throat> a person of trans experience. So, um, along with that, obviously, I'm uh, transgender. And I also think of myself as a post-op male to female transsexual. Derek Terry. I am black, queer. He. <laughs> My name is Christian Gabriel Arroyo. I'm 24 years old. I'll be 25 in December. Uh, I identify as a trans man, trans guy, anything of that sort. Um, I identify as well as pansexual or queer. Again, everything's fluid in that aspect. Um, I identify as middle class. Um, not always being middle class, um, but no. Just growing up the way that I've grown up, um, I've always heard like my grandmother and grandfather were just like terrified of doctors and it, 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 it runs deep. I mean, there's just so many things that have happened over the years, you know, regarding doctors and people of color. As far as trans women of color and healthcare goes, I mean, there's so many situations between the social economic you know not being able to afford you know to see someone or when you can afford to see someone trying to figure out someone who works well with you and you, that you can talk to because when you come into this healthcare system you're going to be asked a lot of uncomfortable questions and you have to be honest with the person that is managing your health the uh, that incident is so long ago that it's, it's really hard to remember the exact details of that first meeting. I do know that um, uh, he wrote me a script for uh, a, what was essentially uh, a birth control pill. Yes. Uh, um, uh, I later found out was probably not uh, a good um, uh, medical treatment, medical therapy, um, because after about uh, about two and a half months of being on um, on the pill, I developed uh, a blood clot uh, in my eye, and I woke up one morning. My eye was uh, my left eye was all blurry. I couldn't see out of it at all, and uh, I was freaking out. And I had my uh, um, I had my girlfriend um, take me to the hospital. Uh, it was a hospital that uh, my mother was working at, um, and I was like, I do not want her to know that I'm here. And I suspected that it was because of the estrogen that I was on that caused um, uh, the clot uh, in my eye. And uh, I was going to, uh, I was going to my the eye doctor that I had seen uh, all of my life and who knew my family, who knew my mom. Um, I didn't say anything at first about being on estrogen. I was still presenting 
Uh, at that moment, I was presenting as a male. I had to register with my legal male name, and um, I acted like I had no idea what was what had happened to cause uh, the blood clot in my eye. I had one. He just it was a doctor. He was a he had this old mentality. I'm not saying he was old, but just the way that he dealt with, you know, he never remembered or was never in the notes that I was gay. So I'd always have to, you know, um, explain that. And it just felt, it made it feel uncomfortable to, to feel like you just have to keep on explaining certain things. You know, uh, I remember one time, this is before gay marriage passed. Are you married? You have any kids? And of course you can be married and have kids. Um, but he's asking very heteronormative questions. And I'm like, no, I'm gay, remember? And he's like, oh, I forgot about that. You know, it was just a really weird, it didn't it did feel good, so. I think the worst part about uh, having a marginalized identity and having it ignored or disrespected in a healthcare setting is that you're so vulnerable you're basically, you know, your, your life is literally in these people's hands. And even if you're not in a hospital, you're in a doctor's office, you're there because something's not right, you know? So you're in pain or you're uncomfortable or you're worried and scared and you're in a vulnerable place and you shouldn't have to be Wonder Woman and, and be this super advocate for yourself in order to just get treated with respect. Um, and both times I was taken by ambulance and couldn't uh, bring my wheelchair because it's a power chair and there's not enough room in the ambulance. I'm in the ER and I'm about between half and three quarters conscious at this point. I'm very fuzzy, very out of it and not very good at communicating what's going on. Um, and I asked the nurse for a bedside commode because stomach virus, you know, and she said, can you walk to the bathroom? And I said, nope. And I had told the ambulance, the, the ambulance attendants that I used a wheelchair. Um, apparently they hadn't passed that on or she wasn't listening or she just didn't care because nobody ever brought me a bedside commode. I have primary bilateral cirrhosis. I was diagnosed when a week before my 22nd birthday. It is a disease that is mainly found in middle-aged women. And I never knew that race would play such a big factor. Um, I tried a new liver doctor here, and one of the things, like, again, I told him, you know, I have PBC. And he's like, no, you don't. And I was like, I have PBC, you're like, got a biopsy, you know, it's happening. And he told me, no, you have a fatty liver. It runs, you know, in Latinos and, you know, African Americans. He's like, you have a fatty liver. You don't have PBC. And like that, like, no test, nothing. Like, just, okay, you're Mexican. This is what you got. Yes, we truly do appreciate those folks for sharing their stories and really being brave and courageous to share those stories that they are experiencing. And myself, I have experienced some ex examples as well. So really what we want to hammer in with that, uh, that clinical skill is a tip that how can you best understand your patient's identity and how they impact their health? Well, first, st set the stage for mutual respect and trust. You can, for example, it's my intention to create a space where you feel safe talking about any concerns you may have about your health. Second, ask about their identities rather than assume. And so in order to better understand and meet your healthcare needs, I'm going to ask you a series of questions about your identities. And, and really piggybacking off of that, understand different identities and different things like, uh, for instance, uh, uh, African Americans are more likely to have sickle cell anemia. Um, and then last, ask about stress and resilience. 
So examples such as what kind of things are stressful right now? And that's a lot to cope with. What do you usually do to cope? Minority stress is a very important thing that is happening in the LGBTQ community. And for those of us who have intersectional marginalized identities, the minority stress is multiplied. Thinking of things such as the history and context of LGBT health and really how this minority stress happens. So first starting in, there was the AIDS crisis that, was started, that really came about in the 1980s to the 1990s. This literally decimated the LGBTQ community um, and killed lots of people. And it was initially known as gay retroactive immune disease or GRID, gay related immuno disease, my apologies. And this was really saying that it was a gay disease. And we now know that anybody can be uh, contract HIV or HIV AIDS. Secondly, is the LGBT uh, identities was pathologized, as I've mentioned multiple times, by medicine and mental health. First was the idea of homosexuality, which was finally removed from the DSM in 1973, as well as gender identity disorder was finally removed and replaced by gender dysphoria in only 2013, very, very recent. And as we can see that people have used shock therapy as well as lobotomies and other ways to treat this as a mental health issue. Currently, we still see conversion therapy or better known as um, prayer camps, straight camps. Um, they're widely used and without consent. Now, the earlier variations of conversion therapy really try to use electric shock and chemical castration. But now that we still see them used today, even despite ample evidence that it causes harm and simply does not work, and if anything, it exacerbates LGBTQ suicide rates. So last clinical tip, skill tip from me, how can you put fearful patients at ease? Everybody's already so uncomfortable when we go to the doctor's office, we're on edge. So as a member of the LGBTQ community, I really appreciate when you acknowledge that I, my fears and reassure me that I'm going to be taken well, get good care of, especially if it's my first time meeting you all. So for example, a good way is to ask, what have your experience been like before in mental health care? And even understanding that they might not be as warming up to you as quickly as you might like. Or you can simply say, I understand that people you, know, uh, people you know or you may have experienced harm, but know that the best practices now is X, Y, Z, and I will follow those best practices. Something that just to note that you don't want to say that it looks like uh, semantically on the page is you never want to say, I understand that you people, uh, just, just to be sure, because that can have a very adverse effect. But now I'm going to pass this over to Stacey Steinbach. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the disparities that we see in this population. This information is coming from Healthy People 2020. As you can see, as we're talking about youth, we see much higher rates of suicide and they're much more likely to be homeless. In fact, um, studies have shown that up to 40% of all homeless youth are LGBT. What that can tell us is that their families aren't safe places for them and that will have lifelong repercussions for them. Um, for example, you might want to look at the ACEs study or Adverse Childhood Experiences study to really understand how those early childhood experiences of rejection and trauma are carried with a young person into well into adulthood and have uh, medical ramifications for these people way down the road. LGBT populations also have the highest rates of tobacco, alcohol, and other drug use. Obviously, that's going to have negative health reper repercussions um, as well throughout a person's lifetime. We see that gay men are at higher risk of HIV and STDs, especially among communities of color. There are many reasons for this, but as you think about that piece of intersectionality, think also about how that affects a person's uh, capacity to access health care, to receive health care, to pay for their health care. All of those things are at uh, play there. Lesbians are less likely to get preventative services for cancer. One of the reasons for that is because they fear discrimination. They also think that they're often not at risk because their populations, their identities are not typically talked about in preventative healthcare messages. Lesbians and bisexual females are more likely to be overweight or obese, and transgender people are at greatest risk for suicide attempts. 
um, in fact, studies show that um, a lifetime suicide risk for a uh, transgender person is at 41% compared to 1.6% for the general population. So we're really talking about a major health crisis for this community. What we do know is that this risk is greatly mitigated by social support. If a person feels supported and they're not isolated, if they feel like they are being accepted rather than um, simply tolerated or rejected, those things are really important, as well as having access to um, transitional medicine, if that is something that a transgender person wants, such as hormones and surgery. Having access to that studies show um, much greater mental health after being able to access those kinds of services. As we think about the healthcare disparities um, experienced by transgender people specifically, we're seeing 19% will refuse care altogether, and even higher numbers among people of color. So again, that intersectional piece showing how there is a real multiplicative effect for people who hold various um, identities that are discriminated against. 28% have been verbally harassed within a medical setting. So knowing that, if you imagine being part of a very small community where people talk a lot to one another, share their experiences with one another, what this means is that although not everyone experiences verbal harassment, so many people do that others in their community are aware of this, and that really creates a community experience of trauma and fear of um, then accessing those medical settings. And then 2% have been physically attacked in a doctor's office, which is why it is so important to look at how you are calling out a patient's name in the waiting room to make sure that you are not outing a patient um, by calling a name that when they stand up to come to the door, that is clearly not gonna be the right name for them um, and then puts them actually at risk um, by other patients uh, in that office. 50% had to teach their medical providers about transgender care. That should not be on the shoulders of our patients to have to teach their medical providers, where although I think that there is a space to say, I don't know much about um, providing care to transgender people. Are you willing um, to help me as I learn? I think there's a space for that, but there's definitely a space for a provider to say, you know what, I learn on the job all the time. I'm gonna go out and do my research. Are you willing to work with me so that as I go out and I do my research and I bring that back to you and I make sure I'm giving you the best care that you're gonna provide me feedback on that? That to me seems like a much more responsible way to go about it. So. In response to this, 28% are postponing their medical treatment, um, and that even means postponing going to the emergency room. And then 33% have delayed or did not try to get preventative health care. So you can imagine, you know, obviously this is going to have um, ramifications throughout a person's life. So as we look at these disparities experienced by transgender people, here's some quotes that rise to the top uh, in these national surveys. And these are things that we certainly hear, Aaron and I, within our community um, here in Louisville, and we feel sure that it, it's happening um, anywhere in, in the country. So for example, I have been refused emergency room treatment even when delivered to the hospital by ambulance with numerous broken bones and wounds. I was forced to have a pelvic exam by a doctor when I went in for a sore throat. The doctor invited others to look at me while he examined me and talked about my genitals. This is such a horrific experience for people and I hear this all the time. I really wanna make sure that um, we're saying out loud and really thinking about um, the empathy that we need to have with our patients to know uh, that this, this is not appropriate behavior. I have been living with excruciating pain, says another person, in my ovaries because I can't find a doctor who will examine my reproductive organs. And this from a transgender man. Now we're going to take a step back and look at this more from a population health perspective of the social determinants of health. What is driving all of this? Kind of what is in the, uh, what are these social determinants that in a kind of very wide part of the funnel are creating these health care disparities at that narrow part of the funnel? So one would be economic stability. And one of the reasons for this is that there is a great lack of legal protections for LGBTQ people in housing and employment. And that greatly contributes to housing instability and financial instability for this population. One of the things to recognize that might not be on everyone's radar is that there are not widespread um, legal uh, um, protections for LGBTQ people. In fact, it's more like a patchwork quilt. 
So um, Aaron and I currently are living in Louisville, and we know that here in Louisville there's a fairness ordinance that provides uh, protection from discrimination in our employment, in our housing, and in what's called public accommodation. So that's like a store, a restaurant, a bus, those kind of public spaces. And so what that means is that we can really feel safe as we uh, come out at work, as we um, are in a restaurant uh, holding a partner's hand or um, on the bus when we're visibly um, queer or gay or trans identified, that we'll be safe in those places, or at least that we have recourse if someone discriminates against us. That is not true for people in Owensboro. It is not true for people in most of the state and most of the country. You can legally be fired from your, your job, you can legally be evicted from your housing, and you can legally um, be told, you know, leave this store or restaurant, we don't serve people like you here. So, <laughs> very important to know that this has a huge impact on people's mental health and also on their financial stability and their um, capacity to have stability in their lifetime. So then there's the health and health care piece of social determinants of health. So uh, an important part of here is that because there is such a widespread experience of discrimination in healthcare, people really delay their preventative care. And what that means is that they're not getting those screenings, um, they're not getting um, a conversation around obesity or ways to improve their health in that preventative care piece, so there's much poorer health outcomes, which is why we see higher cancer rates, for example, in this population. So some of the things that we need to be doing is what we're doing right now, which is providing healthcare providers with more training in order for um, healthcare providers to feel comfortable interacting with their LGBTQ patients and to feel more knowledgeable in doing so. Then there's the social and community context. So um, one of the pieces here that contributes is that there's a, there's a widespread bullying of youth who are perceived to be LGBTQ. It's widespread, it's common, it's well documented. And that really contributes to those poor mental health outcomes for youth and adults. And I referenced that ACEs study before because it's such an important study to show that early childhood trauma has long-term medical impacts, negative medical impacts on people. And this is well understood to be a trauma for people when they're bullied as a youth, whether they are just perceived to be LGBTQ or if they actually are. So, what happens is that when people experience that kind of early um, uh, bullying and discrimination that um, they feel socially isolated into only being themselves, fully authentically themselves in very specific places. So that sense of isolation, but also think about for the gay community what that's meant for us is that it really forces us to only feel comfortable being ourselves and holding a partner's hand, for example, or um, you know, being able to be fully out in places like bars. And so if you were only socializing in a bar, of course you're gonna see higher rates of alcoholism, drug abuse, and smoking. In fact, the only time in my life that I ever smoked was when I first came out, and the only place I felt, felt comfortable was in gay bars. Um, later, when I felt more comfortable about my life, I actually was able to quit smoking, but it was really that socialization context of me only feeling comfortable in bars um, that was contributing to my smoking. When I think about being LGBTQ in Owensboro, here are some of the things that um, I'm thinking about. So this, come, this is a quote from uh, the Reverend of the New Hope Church of Christ who has really spoken out about the experiences of this population within Owensboro. They say, gay and lesbian people living here have, uh, have to come to a great compromise with their own personalities. They must project a false persona with all people at all times. It's a mixture of denial, of self-protection, and is absolutely necessary for them to do this. It takes a tremendous toll on their spirits. And for anyone listening to this lecture and thinking about times that you've been forced to keep a secret about who you are, you'll know what a tremendous toll that takes. It, it, it really requires you um, to put a lot of energy into that. And there's a lot of shame in that as well. The social landscape has improved from the past. However, the, still, the, the following still holds true. There's no fairness ordinance. There's no local non-discrimination policy. So people are still legally getting kicked out of housing or losing a job or in, living in fear of those things happening as well. Um, and then the Human Rights Campaign um, does a, a survey of towns and cities across the United States and they found that Owensboro only scored an 18 out of a possible 100 for the policies held in Owensboro as a city for LGBTQ people um, as well as the, the general climate. 
So as you think about that, you think, wow, there's a lot of opportunities to do some um, advocacy for this population in Owensboro. And that is something that you can do personally as a healthcare provider as you're interacting with your patients, but also more politically if you're comfortable getting involved at that level. When we think about that minority stress piece, I think Aaron um, described this already really well, and I want to I want to fine tune it a little bit to think about um, the factors. So interpersonal pre prejudice and discrimination would be a factor, poor social support and low socioeconomic status. And what we're seeing is that this doesn't just cause mental health um, disparities, but it also causes stress responses that we know to be uh, problematic for good health, and that's high blood pressure and anxiety. These accrue over time and then really have long-term impacts on both mental and physical health. When we think about, wow, who's paying attention to all of this? This is really devastating for this population of people. Luckily, over the last 10 to 15 years, we are seeing national calls from some of our leading national healthcare organizations to improve healthcare. And this is really starting to generate interest on the part of healthcare communities such as yourself. So thank you for that. So let's talk a little bit about the solutions, knowing that the situation is pretty serious. We really support you seeking further educational experiences that support your growth. There's a lot to learn about primary care for this population. So specifically, what screenings, what immunizations, um, what, should you, what should you be thinking about from that primary care perspective to make sure that once somebody who's LGBTQ does find their way to your office, is interacting with you, is kind of brave enough to face all of the stigma, um, what can you be doing in those visits to make sure they're getting their best health care possible? So some of the things that some of the ways that you can get further information would be through our LGBT health certificate that will start in August of 2018. You can email Aaron or I. We've got our information at the end of this um, PowerPoint. And you can email us and say, hey, I'd like to do that certificate. How do I do that? That certificate is mainly done online, so very easy for somebody to do remotely. There is one in-person requirement, and so you could come to Louisville and do that one in-person requirement that um, is in the evening. There's also a National LGBT Health Education Center. All of those modules are excellent. They're online and they're free. I know that they provide CME. They may also provide um, nursing CE. You can advocate on behalf of this population. You can do that in your classroom as you're having classroom discussions. You can do that um, in talking with uh, your faculty and helping them become aware of resources that they can use to be teaching. You can do that within the healthcare environments that you interact, and you can also do that in public policy. Right now, there's so much happening in public policy regarding LGBT health care. Uh, there's, there's really lots of opportunities, um, unfortunately not in a very positive way, but you could be a positive force within that. You can make your research inclusive if you're doing research. Some important questions to ask is what is your sexual orientation? What is your sex assigned at birth? What is your gender identity? If you find yourself doing uh, creating surveys, for example. You can ask questions and avoid assumptions in order to get accurate information. So um, Aaron's already given you some language around how to do that. When we think still about further strategies for that culturally effective care, one of the things that becomes so important is not necessarily that you know we need to be thinking about um, LGBTQ people having like specific diseases, right? But it's really those social determinants of health that are driving these poor out health outcomes. So to go back to that and to think about how important it is to build trust with your patients. So some of the ways that you can do that is by in inclusive non-discrimination policies. Those policies would need to specifically list that you um, do not discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. Those are the three things to make sure are part of a non-discrimination policy. And then in your intake forms, make sure that those are um, something that reflect the realities of LGBTQ people. So instead of having mother, father on a pediatric form, list uh, parent or guardian instead of making it gendered. Visual cues in a waiting room are very, very helpful. This is a community that has some very specific visual cues, such as um, a rainbow, such as um, the uh, human rights campaign symbol, which is like an, uh, a blue background and a yellow equality or equals sign. So look for some of those visual cues. You can do a simple search on, on Google for that and then post those. They don't even have to be big, but post those somewhere where your patients will be sure to see them. And also know that that is something that um, people who are not LGBTQ will probably not even notice 
people are often concerned, oh my gosh, are my other patients going to notice that and they're not going to come to my practice anymore? I have not found that to be an issue at all. This is something that LGBTQ people really hone in on. They're looking for those visual cues and other people, they're not looking for them. They don't tend to see them. It's kind of amazing. You can also record the patient name and use to make sure that you're using the name of the patient as they prefer to be called. Now you do need to make sure that for insurance purposes and billing that you're collecting their, um, uh, their legal name or their name on insurance. But for good patient care, to build trust, it's so important to actually use the name that this person uses. Um, use the, and also ask for those pronouns. A good way to do that is simply to say, we ask all of our patients this because we serve a diverse patient base. What pronouns do you use? And then people don't feel signaled out, but they also feel like, oh my gosh, this place gets it. They're asking me for my pronouns. That's really cool. You can also advocate for system-wide use. So if you're the only provider who's doing that in your particular um, clinical area, you could help other people understand why you're doing that. You can advocate for training for staff and providers, and um, we've given you some resources of where to go and get that training, and for safe and respectful workplaces because you're working with people who are LGBTQ too. I assure you that many of the providers that you're working with or many staff members um, have these identities as well. You can build trust by also acknowledging potential distrust in medical systems and saying, I get it. I know that people often have poor experiences in the healthcare system. What have those experiences been for you? And I want to make them better. When people hear that, it makes such a huge difference in how much they can trust you. Assure confidentiality and also ask questions. So if you are going to record SO or sexual orientation or GI, gender identity, Make sure that you're saying, I assure you I'm not going to be sharing this with other people. Here are the, um, uh, what um, sexual orientation and gender identity do you hold? So asking people about those. And then also before you record that into an EHR, make sure that you're asking the person if that's all right, especially in Owensboro or in other places where you do not have legal protections for this population. It's very important that people are not accidentally or intentionally outed. Both of those things unfortunately happen. Use universal language. So when you say things like, how would you like to be addressed? That works for all patients, but particularly for your transgender patients, they're really hearing that and appreciating that. And then um, to not make any assumptions about who that person is dating or married to. So instead of saying, you know, what is your wife's name? Uh, you could say, do you currently have a partner? And finally, don't ask questions out of curiosity. It's very important that while you show interest in your patients and you want to come to understand who they are, it's important to not um, ask questions out of curiosity. Patients certainly pick up on that. It makes them very uncomfortable. In order to ask questions that you need to ask, but not run that risk, what you can do is to say, in order for me to provide you with the health, best health care possible, I need to know if you've had any surgeries, or I need to do an organ inventory. What organs do you have, and what organs have been removed or altered? Those are ways to ask questions that can be sensitive questions in a way that people can understand that it's part of their health care experience rather than your own curiosity. Some excellent resources that are statewide and available to you in Owensboro as well as um, around the state of Kentucky. Our PFLAGs are very um, active here in Louisville and can be found in other places in the state, so you can look that up and see if there's a PFLAG near you. And to know that even though this stands for Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays, it's a support group for families and friends, it's very trans-inclusive, so know that this is also a trans-inclusive support group. Louisville Youth Group is something that many youth will travel to for many hours away in order to have a support group for them. It's excellent. They do a lot of um, leadership training and providing a social and support network for young people. So even if you don't have something like this in Owensboro, know that young people will often travel to make sure that they get this. It's that important to them. OutCare Health is a national organization that has a state-level directory of LGBT-friendly health care and mental health providers. Please. List yourself on healthcare if you feel like you can, if you can say, yes, I'm an LGBT friendly provider. And let your patients know that they can also use that to find providers. Trans Woman National is an adult support group for persons who are trans feminine. And then Louisville Trans Men is an adult support group for people who are trans masculine. The LGBT Center at UofL, you're welcome to email us or call us and ask us for further resources. 
And then the Fairness Campaign is a statewide um, political organization working towards the equal rights for LGBT citizens. So if you feel, um, if you're feeling galvanized right now to do more to help people who are LGBTQ in Owensboro, please know that there's a way to do this through the Fairness Campaign. National resources that you can, um, that you can access would be the Family Acceptance Project. It is absolutely excellent. You can go right now and download that information so that when you're working with a parent of an LGBTQ young person, you can provide them with information about how to support their young person to decrease their suicide risk. The Fenway Institute is what has those free online modules. And then the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association has some excellent information as well, such as that um, guidelines for the care of LGBT patients. And then the Center of Excellence for Transgender Health is truly excellent. They really provide the best guidelines around transgender health care so that if a person comes to you, for example, who would like to receive hormonal treatment um, in their transition and you're thinking, hmm, I'm not really sure what those protocols are, you can find them there on their website as well as many other pieces of primary health care. And then here's our contact information for Aaron and myself. And um, please know that you are welcome to contact us at any time, and we will try to get you to, your, um, to the best resources possible. Thank you again. We appreciate your interest in this topic, and um, we invite you to stay in contact with us. Absolutely. Y'all have a great day. Please credit the LGBT Center at the University of Louisville. Thank you.